So as we, uh, we're coming to the last chapter of um, 1 Timothy, and I was just saying how it's, it's like uh, at, the, at, the end of the chapter, at the end of the letter, Paul is really wanting to just remind um, Timothy of, of some really important things. And there's, there, there's two key things, a warning and an encouragement. And um, so we'll go to the end of verse 2 where Paul says, these are the things you are to teach and insist on. And just briefly in verse 3 to 5, Paul talks about some teachers who are not satisfied with the basic gospel teaching. They're getting sidetracked with their own head ideas maybe. We're not sure exactly, but whatever it is, they're argumentative. They're fighting and, and um, over the meaning of words. They're, they're just bickering over little things which are not really at the core of what, of what um, Paul's uh, saying is, is the gospel. They're not living out as well what Paul has been saying all along. Our teaching must not only be right doctrine, but it must also be right living. There must be a graciousness, a kindness and a love shown to others. Their arguing results in quarrels, jealousy and mistrust between brothers and sisters. This isn't right and it shows that these people have lost their understanding of the truth. I think for us the message is, this is what, how we need to act. Am I encouraging my brothers and sisters to keep the gospel and Jesus central? And am I lovingly uh, seeking the truth with you? Am I, am I doing this in a loving way? And then at the end of verse 5, there are the sad words that in some cases these people who are being argumentative have thought that being godly was a way to become rich. Underneath their speech and maybe their nice sounding words, there's this love of money, which he now addresses in verses 6 to 10 and 17 to 19. Money. Hmm. Hmm. I guess for all of us, there's always that thought that if I just have a little bit more, if I actually have a lot more, it'll be even better, life will be a lot better. But Paul encourages us here to be content with what we have. The easy reading translation of the Bible expresses it this way, devotion to God is, in fact, a way for people to be very rich, but only if it makes them satisfied with what they have. Devotion to God is, in fact, a way for people to be very rich, but only if it makes them satisfied with what they have. And, then the, and that really is the heart of the title for my talk today, How to Become Rich. It's not going after money, it's being satisfied with what God has given us. True riches that cannot be taken away, they have their foundation in knowing and trusting God being satisfied in him. And Paul reminds us, we took nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. They're great words, aren't they, to remember and to, to keep thinking about day by day to help us to stay on the right track. And Paul has some sober warnings for us. The words in verse 9 are very strong, in verse 9 and 10. And they were obviously relevant in Paul's day, but I reckon they're even more relevant for us today in our Western society. Never before in history has there been such a relentless pursuit of riches, of money, of wealth, by more and more highly developed means. Our society actually elevates the love of money to the highest and greatest good. So if someone were to ask me, why did you do that? And I responded, oh, because I could make more money that way. That would be the end of the discussion because, yeah, well, that's, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, that's good. There's no thought about if that's right or wrong. People are tripping over each other to become rich. And the greatest irony is that it's done in the name of contentment. I'll be happy if I can just get this or that or have a bigger home or have this item or that. We know the saying, money can't buy you happiness, but everything around us is screaming out that having more money will buy you happiness. All the advertisements, what do the advertisements say? Ah, you deserve it. You need it. <clears throat> you should have it. 
everyone else is getting it. But Paul warns his hearers in verse 9 and 10, if your desire is to get rich, this will lead you into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Well, that's a pretty strong warning, isn't it? Temptation, trap, foolish, harmful, ruin and destruction. We have a choice and we need to choose wisely. Be content. And Paul says in this famous phrase, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Often uh, misquoted or misunderstood, but having money isn't the problem. It's the love of money, the craving it, thinking that it will solve all my problems. And then Paul says, worst of all, it causes people to turn away from God and they live to regret this bitterly. I remember uh, I was reading about um, Nelson Rockefeller, who was one of the most wealthy men in America at a, in another age. When he was asked by a reporter, how much money do you reckon you need to, to live on comfortably? He replied, a little bit more than I get. And I thought, even Rockefeller, who's so wealthy, has everything, wasn't content with what he had. Just, just a little bit more. The love of money causes a deep dissatisfaction. Let's pray for each other that we would practice contentment in God. Let's help each other to do that. And let's not be people who grasp after money. And it's interesting, as Paul goes on in verse 17 to 19, he doesn't do what Jesus does with the rich young ruler. Remember that story where the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus, you know, they went through all the, all the, all the uh, commandments. And, basically, and then Jesus said at the end, give everything away. Sell everything that you have because that's what's keeping you from following me. What does Paul say? He says, command those who are rich not to be arrogant. Don't put your, help in, your hope in wealth. Your wealth can go in an instant, just like that. Economic recession, floods, death, sickness, all those things, things that are out of our control. But what does Paul advise? Put your hope in God who richly provides with everything for our enjoyment. So our hope or our trust is to be in God. He will never fail. And Paul has two more things to say on this. Firstly, command the rich to be generous with their wealth. He doesn't actually say give it all away, but he says make sure that you're generous. Be generous hearted with a willingness to share with others, but also be rich in good deeds. Live out the gospel. Be self-controlled, loving, gentle, godly, generous, and all those other qualities. And then secondly, he says, by living this way, you are laying up treasure for yourselves in heaven. And this is taking hold of real life. And this isn't being good and generous so that we'll somehow buy our way into heaven. No, it's not that. It's, it's because God is, God's spirit is at work in us that we now want to live with this generous heart. We want to live out this life which we'll, we will be living for the rest of our eternity. And you know, as we look at God, as we look at Jesus, we see a Father, we see a Saviour who is generous to us. And so we want to live like Him. And this applies to all believers, whatever your circumstances. If you're poor, our required obedience will be appropriate for our poverty. If we're rich, our required obedience will be appropriate for our wealthy state. And it may mean giving it all away. But we need to be listening to God and how he's directing us. The point in either case is not that one category has an unfair advantage, but that each, as God has given to us, we all individually are responsible to God for how for the things he's given us. We're not to compare ourselves to others. We are all preparing for the life which is really life, as opposed to the present age, which is a bare shadow of that which is to come. So we finish off by going back to verse 11 to 16 and verse 20 and 21. With all these warnings about money, Paul says to Timothy, 
okay, you man of God, flee from all of this. Flee from all of it. Flee from this love of money, this grasping after things. <clears throat> and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Do you hear those two words? Flee and pursue. Flee, run away from, turn your back on the love of money and proactively pursue those qualities of God. Again, it's strong language, but it makes sense, doesn't it? And we need to help each other with this. Help each other to flee from those things that are, not, that are going to keep us from God, from following God, and to pursue those things of God. And then he says, fight the good fight of the faith. The message actually uses different words. It says, run hard and fast in the faith. I like that as well, both those sort of ideas, fighting, running, exerting energy. It's not going to happen just mooching around. And that's a good rebuke for me because <clears throat> I can easily just sort of take things easy, easy going, but it's a reminder to me it's going to take exertion. It's going to be hard work. And then he says, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Or in the message, it says it even more strongly, seize the eternal life you were called to. Take hold of, grab, on, grab onto, don't let go, seize. Again, active words. And it's a day-by-day day living this out. It's a day-by-day day striving in God's strength and power, resting in Him. It may not be wildly exciting stuff. It may just be faithfully, day-by-day, day, looking to follow God. But these are helpful words, aren't they? Flee, pursue, take hold, seize. How do we do this, my friends? In every way possible. Going to the men's retreat might be a helpful stimulus for you as you gather with the other guys and together strengthen each other in Christ to keep going, to flee, to pursue and to seize eternal life. Or in our home groups and Bible studies, in our prayer triplets or pairs, whatever is going to help us, let's go for it. Remember the beginning of last year, 16 months ago, I was talking about being apprentices of Jesus and then as we looked at Hebrews, I think it was chapter 2, I gave us this question, will it help me run? Will it help me run? Will the choice I'm making help me follow Jesus, fight the good faith, seize the eternal life? What's going to help me run? And what is this life that, that God's called us to? It's this life, in verse 12, to which you are called by God, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. This good confession was the confession that Jesus is Lord and I trust in him alone. And Paul says Jesus too made this good confession before Pilate, declaring that he was indeed the King of the Jews, the Messiah, the world's true Lord. And then there's this wonderful finish here by Paul. It's almost as if he just can't find the words to describe how amazing, how powerful, how wonderful is God. And he says in verse 15, he cries out, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honour and might forever. Amen like the psalm that, that George was telling us about as well, as God reveals himself to David. Now, I, I thought, as I read those words, I, I wonder if those words don't have quite the same impact for us today as they, uh, as they might have for the Christians in Ephesus, because as they heard those words from Paul, those words were subversive words for that society, and they challenged the beliefs of those around them. It challenged the beliefs of both the Romans and the Greeks. Here is Paul saying, God, the only true God, the only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, not the Roman Caesar who said he was divine. No, Caesar will actually bow before Jesus. The word that's used for appearing in that, in that um, uh, verse there is the word that you would use for the coming of the great king, 
like Caesar. Here, though, Paul says Jesus appearing at the right time is the only appearing that will really count, that will ultimately count. And then to the Greeks. I love the way N.T. Wright describes this. He says, the Greeks believed that every human being had an immortal soul that lived on after bodily death, no matter what they did. And Paul challenges this head on. He says, yes, um, I do believe in an afterlife for all people. Yep, that, that's, that's true. And I do believe in a judgment when someone dies, which will determine the happiness or misery of the life to come. But Paul says there's never a time where God says in, uh, people actually have an immortal soul. People don't have an immortal soul. He says clearly in verse 16, God alone, only God is immortal. God is the ultimate reality. His very being consists of such blinding light that the brightest human illumination is dark by comparison and must hide from his dazzling brightness. Where human beings gain a, a deathless life, which is what immortality means, they do so because God gives it to them as a fresh gift of grace. Because he died and rose again. We can live forever with God. And for, and for Paul, this new deathless life won't be lived in a disembodied soul. It will be lived as a new risen body. So Paul says to Timothy, yes, it may seem like the Romans have all the power and the Greeks have all the wisdom, but they have nothing on the power and the wisdom of God. And for us today, Paul says, look at your amazing God. Look at your amazing God. He's the one who has conquered death and he's preparing us for the day when we will live with him forever. With these words about God and the commands to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love and endurance and gentleness. This is such a graphic contrast with the attitude that he describes in verse 9 and 10 of those who love money, those people who will fall into the traps and temptations and in the end they will die for the sake of a love of money. Our encouragement as we look at our magnificent God who died and rose again to save us is that our heads are lifted up and we see where we're called to go. Rather than looking at the rest of the world and being consumed with jealousy for the material wealth that others have got, let's chase after the God who loves us, who will truly satisfy more than money and wealth. And again, one last example as we finish. N.T. Wright gives this example. He says, think of an animal that... that um, that you'd really be afraid of. It might be something like an angry rhinoceros, or it could be something small like a horrible spider, a large spider. If you come around a corner and you find yourself facing that animal, or that, that insect, what would you want to do? You'd run away, of course. Well, that's how you should feel about the greedy, jealous lifestyle of those who want to be rich. Then think how you'd feel if you saw the person you loved best in all the world and you hadn't seen them for years and they've just walked around the corner, what would you do? Well, you'd chase after them, of course. You'd run excitedly to them. Well, that's how you should behave with these virtues. Godliness, faith, love, patience and gentleness. They don't come about by accident. They occur in someone's life because that person has chased after them energetically, has worked at them, has chosen again and again to live that way rather than the other way. People who do that discover in the process that they are beginning in the present to live the life of the coming age. That's why when the King of Kings reveals his son, they will be ready for him and will celebrate his royal appearing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this warning and this encouragement from Paul. Thank you that you are the God who is above everything. You are more powerful than the Romans. You are more wise than the Greeks and anything else that we have today in this world. We pray that we would stick to you, that we would run after you, 
that we would ask ourselves continually, what is going to help us to, to follow you? What's going to help us to 